The Religion of Islam Presented by the Quran and Sunnah Part 5 After his uncle's death, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, suffered harm. They would place filth, taken from animals, over his back while he was praying at the Kaaba. Thereafter, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, headed to Taif, 70 kilometers from Mecca, to call its people to Islam. They, however, opposed his call more vehemently than the people of Mecca and incited their fools to throw stones at the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, as they expelled him from their town. They followed him with stones and injured his honored heels. In that state, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, turned to his Lord in supplication and pursuit of support. So, Allah Almighty sent him the angel telling him that his Lord had heard the people's reaction to him, and he would cause the two large mountains to crash upon them, if he so willed. He replied, No, but I hope that Allah would bring out of their children those who would worship Allah alone and associate none with him. Then, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, returned to Mecca, where the hostility continued towards all those who believed in him. Later, a delegation from Yathrib, which was then called Medina came to him, and he invited them to Islam. They embraced Islam. So, he sent with them one of his companions, called Musab ibn Yumer, to teach them Islam. Many from the people of Medina accepted Islam at his hand. The following year, they came back to the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, to give him the Pledge of Allegiance on Islam. Then, he instructed his persecuted companions to emigrate to Medina, which they did, individually and in groups. They were, thus, called Al-Muhajirin, the immigrants. The people of Medina welcomed and honored them and shared with them their houses and properties. Hence, they were later called Al-Ansar, the supporters. When Quraysh learned about this hydra, immigration, they were determined to kill the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Hence, they planned to besiege the house where he passed the night and to strike him collectively with the sword on coming out. Allah Almighty saved him, however, and he came out while they were unaware. Then, Abu Bakr as Siddiq caught up with him and he instructed Ali to stay in Mecca to return the trusts left with the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, to their owners. While the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was on the path of Hydra. Quraysh declared a huge prize for whoever could seize Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, alive or dead. But Allah Almighty saved him and made him and his companion reach Medina safe and sound. The people of Medina received him in a welcoming, cheerful, and an extremely joyful manner. They all came out to meet him, chanting, The Messenger of Allah has come, the Messenger of Allah has come. The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, settled in Medina. The first thing he did was constructing a mosque, where the prayer would be performed. He began to teach people the laws of Islam and noble morals and to recite the Quran to them. His companions rallied around him, taking guidance from him, purifying their souls, and refining their manners. Their love for the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, deepened and they got influenced by his sublime attributes, and the brotherly bond of faith strengthened among them. Medina truly became a utopia that lived in an atmosphere of happiness and brotherliness, with no difference between rich and poor, black and white, and Arab and non-Arab. The only criterion of distinction was faith and piety. Out of this elite community, the best generation that history has ever known emerged. One year after the Prophet's Hydra, confrontations and battles began between the Messenger of Allah along with his companions against Quraysh and its allies who were hostile towards Islam. Medina truly became a utopia that lived in an atmosphere of happiness and brotherliness, with no difference between rich and poor, black and white, and Arab and non-Arab. The only criterion of distinction, out of this elite community, the best generation that history has ever known emerged. One year after the Prophet's Hydra, confrontations and battles began between the Messenger of Allah along with his companions against Quraysh and its allies who were hostile towards Islam. The first battle between the two sides, the Great Battle of Badr, took place in a valley located between Mecca and Medina. Allah Almighty supported the Muslims, 314 fighters, against Quraysh, 1,000 fighters. The Muslims attained a clear victory, 
killing 70 of the Quraysh fighters, most of them were leaders and senior figures, and taking 70 captives, while the rest ran away. There followed other battles between the Messenger of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, and Quraysh. In the last of which, eight years after his leaving Mecca, he managed to lead an army of 10,000 Muslim fighters towards Mecca to attack Quraysh on their own grounds and inflict a crushing defeat on them. He overcame his tribe that had sought to kill him, tortured his companions, and prevented people from the religion that Allah sent down to him. Following this remarkable victory, he gathered them and said, Zero people of Quraysh, what do you think I will do to you? They said, You are a noble brother and the son of a noble brother. He said, Go, for you are set free. He pardoned them and gave them the free choice to embrace Islam. This prompted people to enter the religion of Islam in multitudes, and then the entire Arabian Peninsula embraced Islam. Shortly afterwards, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, performed Hajj along with 114,000 who had recently embraced Islam. On the day of Arafah, he stood and delivered a sermon in which he clarified the rulings and laws of Islam. Then, he remarked, I may not meet you after this year. Behold! Those present should convey this to those who are absent. Then, he looked at them and said, Have I conveyed the message? The people replied, Yes. He said, O oh Allah, bear witness. He again said, Have I conveyed the message? The people replied in the affirmative, and he said, O oh Allah, bear witness. After Hajj, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, returned to Medina and one day he addressed people saying that Allah Almighty gave someone a choice between living eternally and what is with Allah, and he chose what is with Allah. The companions wept, knowing that he had meant himself and that his departure from this world was imminent. On Monday, the 12th of Rabi al 11 a.h., the Prophet's illness worsened, and he started suffering the throes of death. He gave a farewell look at his companions and exhorted them to adhere to performing the prayer. Then he breathed his last and departed to the Supreme Companion. The companions were extremely shocked and sad for his death to the extent that one of them, Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, unsheathed his sword and threatened to kill anyone. Saying that the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, had died. Thereupon, Abu Bakr came and reminded him of the verse saying, Muhammad is only a messenger like the messengers of Allah who came before him, who died or were killed. If he were to die or be killed would you turn back from your faith, and stop fighting? Whoever among you turns back from his faith will not harm Allah in any way. He is the strong, the victorious. Such a person only harms himself by exposing himself to loss in this world and the afterlife. Allah will reward those who are thankful to him by making them firm in their faith and in struggling for his sake. Surat al-Imran 144. Upon hearing this verse, Umar fell unconscious. This is Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, the seal of all prophets and messengers. Allah sent him to all mankind as a warner and bringer of glad tidings. And he conveyed the message, fulfilled the trust, and gave sincere advice to the Ummah. Allah Almighty supported him with the Noble Quran, the Divine revealed speech that, no falsehood can approach it from the front or from behind. A revelation from the one who is all-wise, praiseworthy. And indeed, it is a noble and protected book. Falsehood in the form of subtraction, addition, change or distortion cannot come to it directly or indirectly. It is a revelation from one who is wise in his creation, decree and legislation, and praiseworthy in all conditions. Surat Fusilat, 42 if all people, from the beginning of humanity to the end of times, were to gather and jointly try to produce something like the Quran, they would not be able to. Even if they collaborated with one another. Allah Almighty says. 
O people, worship no one other than your Lord, because He created you and the people before you, so that you may save yourselves from suffering. By following His instructions and keeping away from what He has prohibited. It is He who made the earth like a carpet spread out in front of you and it is He who masterfully constructed the sky over you. Through His grace rain falls, producing different crops from the earth, as produce for you. Do not, then, consider others to be equal to Allah, when you know that He alone is worthy of being worshipped. Allah challenges those who have any doubt about the Quran revealed to His servant, Muhammad, peace be upon him, to produce a chapter just like it, and to call their helpers. If they are truthful about what they say. If they are unable to do so, and they will never be able to do it, they should be mindful of the fire of hell, which burns with people who deserve the torment. And with the idols which they used to worship instead of Allah, punishing both the idol worshippers and what they worshipped. The fire of hell has been prepared as a punishment for the disbelievers. The warnings in the previous verses were for the disbelievers, so now the messenger is told to address the believers. Give good news to those who have faith in Allah and do good, and tell them about that which will please them, gardens in paradise, with rivers flowing beneath their palaces and trees. Whenever they are given fruits from the gardens to consume, they will comment on how similar they are to the fruits of the earth, saying, this is similar to what we had before. They will be given fruits that carry the same name and shape, so that they may recognize and desire them, but they will in fact taste differently. In the garden they will be paired with their mates, who will not have any unpleasant traits that people have on earth. And they will live there in eternal bliss, unlike the bliss of the earth which is only temporary. Surat al-Baqarah, 21-25 The Quran consists of 114 surahs, which comprise over 6,000 verses. Allah Almighty challenges people over all ages to produce one surah similar to its surahs, knowing that the shortest surah in the Quran consists of three verses only. If they could do so, they would then know that this Quran did not come from Allah. Indeed, this is one of the greatest miracles by which Allah supported His Messenger. He also supported him with other miracles and supernatural acts, such as the following. e. Supporting the Prophet with miracles. 1. He would supplicate Allah and place his hand in a vessel, and as a result, water would spring forth from between his fingers. The whole army, more than a thousand, would drink from this water. 2. He would supplicate Allah and place his hand in food, which would increase in the bowl and suffice 1500 companions. 3. He would raise his hands towards the sky in supplication for rain and before leaving his place, drops of water would fall down his face from rain, and other numerous miracles. Allah Almighty also supported him with his protection. None of those seeking to kill him would ever be able to reach him and extinguish the light that he came with from Allah. In the Quran, Allah says, O Messenger, communicate what has been revealed to you from your Lord completely and do not hide anything of it. If you do hide anything, then you are not one who conveys the message of his Lord. The Prophet, peace be upon him, communicated everything he was instructed to. Anyone who claims anything to the contrary has spoken a great lie about Allah. Allah will protect you from people and they will not be able to harm you. Your duty is only to communicate the divine message. Allah will not bless with guidance those who disbelieve and who have no desire to be guided. Surat al-Ma'idah, 67 Despite Allah's support for him, the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was still a role model in all his words and deeds. And he was the first to obey the divine commands revealed to him, the most keen on performing the acts of worship and obedience, and the most generous, readily spending in charity whatever he had. Giving it to the poor and needy, even the inheritance as he once said, we, the prophets, do not leave inheritance. Whatever we leave is charity. Narrated by Ahmad, 2463, with an authentic Isnad, a similar hadith, which was mentioned by Ahmad Shakir in his review of Musnad, 1992, reads. My heirs will not inherit a dinar, for whatever I leave, excluding the adequate support of my wives the wage of a worker, is to be given in charity. As for his morals, they are higher than anyone could ever reach.
everyone who accompanied him would love him from the bottom of his heart, and the Prophet would become dearer to him than his children, parents, and all people. Anas Ibn Malik, the Prophet's servant, said, I never touched a hand that is better, softer, or more fragrant than the hand of the Messenger of Allah. I served him for ten years, and he never said to me, Why did you do that, for something I had done, nor did he ever say to me, Why did you not do that, for something I had not done. Narrated by Al-Bukhari, 4230 This is Muhammad the Messenger of Allah. Our Lord raised his status and reputation among all humankind. No one is mentioned today in the whole world as often as he is mentioned. Since 1400 years, millions of minarets all over the globe announce the Adhan, call to prayer, five times a day and proclaim, I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. And millions of worshippers repeat the same phrase tens of times every day in their prayers, I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. F. The Noble Companions After the Prophet's death, his noble companions shouldered the responsibility of the call to Islam and dispersed far and wide to spread it. They were, indeed, the best callers to this religion. Of all people, they were the most truthful in speech, the most just, and the most honest, and they had the greatest interest in guiding people and spreading goodness among them. They assumed the morals and traits of the prophets. So, their morals played a remarkable role in people's acceptance of this religion in different parts of the world. They willingly embraced Islam in large numbers, from West Africa to East Asia and Central Europe, without any coercion. These are the companions of the Messenger of Allah, the best people after the Prophets. The most famous among them are the four rightly guided caliphs, who ruled the Muslim state after the Prophet's death. They are 1. Abu Bakr as Siddiq 2. Umar ibn al-Khattab 3. Uthman ibn Affan 4. Ali ibn Abi Talib Muslims hold feelings of recognition and appreciation towards them and draw close to Allah Almighty by loving His Messenger and His companions, men and women, respecting and revering them. No one would hate or insult them except a disbeliever in Islam, even if he claims to be a Muslim. Allah Almighty praises them saying sad face you are the best nation ever raised for mankind, you enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong, and believe in Allah. You are, O community of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the best of all communities that Allah has produced for humanity, in your faith and actions, and the most beneficial for other people. Instructing what is right according to the sacred law and what you know to be right, and forbidding what is wrong according to the sacred law and what you know to be wrong. And having certain faith in Allah, so that it shows in your actions. If the people of the scripture, the Jews and the Christians, had faith in Muhammad it would be better for them in this world and in the afterlife. Only few of the people of the scripture believe in what Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with and most of them do not stay within the sacred way of life and sacred law of Allah. Surat al-Imran, 110 And he affirmed his pleasure with them when they gave the Pledge of Allegiance to the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, as he says. Indeed, Allah was pleased with the believers when they pledged allegiance to you, O Prophet, under the tree. He knew what was in their hearts, so he sent down tranquility upon them and rewarded them with an imminent victory. Verily, Allah was pleased with the believers when they were giving their oaths to you at Udabiya i.e. Bayat al-Ridwan under the tree. Allah knew of the faith, sincerity and honesty in their hearts and sent down tranquility on their hearts. And he rewarded them for it with a victory in the near future i.e. the victory over Kabar, as consolation for them missing out on being able to enter Makkah. Surat al-Fath, 18 4. The Pillars of Islam Islam has five main pillars which a Muslim must fulfill in order to be a true Muslim. They are a. First pillar, the testimony that there is no God worthy of worship, 
but Allah, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. It is the first word to be pronounced by a person embracing Islam. He should say, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship, but Allah, and that Muhammad is the slave and messenger of Allah, believing in all its meanings, which we have explained above. He should believe that Allah is the one and only God who did not beget and was not begotten, and there is none like unto him, that he is the creator and everything else is created. And that he alone is the God worthy of being worshipped, and there is no God or Lord but him. He should also believe that Muhammad is the slave and messenger of Allah, to whom the revelation came down from heaven, conveying Allah's commands and prohibitions. And that we should believe him in whatever he reported and obey him in what he commanded or prohibited. b. Second Pillar, Establishing Prayer In prayer, the features of servitude and submission to Allah Almighty are manifest. A servant stands humble, reciting verses from the Quran and extols his Lord by different kinds of dhikr, remembrance of Allah, and praise. He bows down and prostrates himself to the Creator, privately invoking him and asking from his great bounty. So, prayer is a link between a servant and his Lord who created him and knows his secret and open matters. Prayer wins won the love, nearness, and pleasure of Allah Almighty. Whoever abandons it out of arrogance incurs the wrath and curse of Allah and becomes an apostate. The obligatory prayers are five every day, comprising standing and the recitation of Surat al-Fatiha, in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the most compassionate, the most merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment. You are alone we worship, and you are alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have blessed, not of those who incurred your wrath, or of those who went astray. Surat al-Fatiha, 1-7 In addition to reciting some other verses from the Quran, as well as bowing down, prostrating, supplicating, making takbir by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the Most Great, exalting Allah in bowing by saying, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Glory be to my Lord, the Majestic, and in prostration by saying, Subhana Rabbi Al-Ilah, Glory be to my Lord, the Most High. Before performing prayer, a Muslim should be free from impurities, urine and excrement, in his body, clothes, and the place of prayer. He should make ablution with water, washing his face and hands and wiping over his head and then washing his feet. If he is ritually impure, due to sexual intercourse, he should take a bath, washing his whole body. See, third pillar, Zakah. It is a specific percentage, 2.5% of capital assets, which Allah Almighty ordained on the rich to be given to the poor and needy and all those who are entitled to it in the community. It aims at fulfilling people's needs and ending their poverty. This pillar is a cause of spreading social solidarity in the society and fostering love, friendliness, and cooperation among its members. It helps eliminate hatred and rancor felt by the poor and the underprivileged towards the rich and wealthy.
it also plays a key role in the growth and prosperity of economy and the movement of money in a right way, thus reaching all sections of the society. Zakah is due on properties of all kinds money, cattle, fruits, grains, goods, etc. There are different percentages on capital assets of each kind. D. Fourth Pillar, Fasting the Month of Ramadan Fasting is to abstain from eating, drinking, and having sexual intercourse with wives from dawn to sunset with the intention of worshipping Allah. Ramadan, in which fasting is due, is the ninth lunar month. It is also the month in which the revelation of the Quran to Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, started. Allah Almighty says, Ramadan is a month in which the Quran was sent down as a guidance for mankind and as clear signs that show the right way and distinguish between right and wrong. Whoever of you witnesses this month, should fast. The Quran was first revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on the night of decree in the month of Ramadan. Allah revealed it as a guidance for people, with clear proofs of its guidance, and the criterion between the truth and falsehood. Whoever reaches the month of Ramadan, and is well and healthy, is required to fast, and whoever is ill, or for whom fasting is difficult, or is traveling, then they may break their fast. If they do not fast then they must perform make-up fasts for the days they missed at another time. Allah intends ease, and not hardship, in what He decrees for you. And wants you to complete the right number of days and to glorify Him upon the completion of Ramadan, on the day of Eid, as He helped you and made it possible for you to fast. So that you thank Allah for guiding you to this religion which He has approved for you. Surat al-Baqarah 185. Among the great benefits of fasting is being accustomed to patience and boosting one's piety and faith in the heart. This is because fasting is a secret between a servant and his Lord. When one is alone, he can eat and drink without anyone knowing about it. So, when he refrains from that in worship and obedience to Allah Almighty alone, with no partner, knowing that only Allah watches over this act of worship, This increases his faith and sense of heedfulness. That is why the reward of the fasting people will be great. There is even a special gate in paradise for them, called Aran. Outside Ramadan, a Muslim can observe voluntary fasting any day throughout the year, except for the two days of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. E. Fifth Pillar Performing Hajj It is obligatory upon a Muslim to perform Hajj once in a lifetime. He can do more than that voluntarily. Allah Almighty says sad face pilgrimage to the house is a duty owed to Allah upon all people who are able to make their way to it, Surat al-Imran. 97. To perform Hajj, a Muslim travel to the designated places of the rituals in Mecca during the month of Hajj, namely the last Hijri lunar month. Before entering Mecca, he has to take off his usual clothes and wear the clothing of Iram, ritual state of consecration, two white garments. Then, the pilgrim performs different rituals of Hajj, such as tawaf, circumambulation, around the Kaaba, Sai, walking, between Safa and Marwa, standing at Arafah, and spending the night at Muzdalifah. Hajj is the biggest gathering of Muslims on earth, where the spirit of brotherliness, mercy, and sincerity prevails among them. Their clothing is the same, and so are their rituals. There is no superiority for one over another except in terms of piety. The reward of Hajj is great as stated by the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Whoever performs Hajj without having sexual intercourse or committing sins will come out of his sins like the day he was born. Narrated by Al-Bukhari, 2164, in the Book of Hajj, Chapter. Merit of the Accepted Hajj Whoever performs Hajj without having sexual intercourse or committing sins will come out of his sins like the day he was born. Narrated by Al-Bukhari, 2164, in the Book of Hajj, Chapter, Merit of the Accepted Hajj.